Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ongamon Timke. I'm your program director for this afternoon. If we may be get the, if we may uh, get seated, we're going to start now. The dignity, the dignitaries are outside. Um, once they've come in, can you welcome them uh, and, and stand uh, for them, please, until they are seated? Thank you. We may be seated. Thank you. Once again, um, welcome. This is the inaugural lecture uh, of uh, Archbishop Tabo Makoba. It's an annual lecture that's going to be continuing, and it's a program run by the Faculty of Humanities at Nelson Mandela University. And I said before, as I said before, my name is Ongaman Dimka. I have the honor of being your program director this afternoon. It's an amazing period in which the Faculty of Arts is uh, revitalizing the humanities. And we kick it off with a very powerful session uh, this year. We are going to have, without wasting time, the uh, meditation through the choir rendition of uh, Diosoga's Liza Lisiting Alako by the great choir of Nelson Mandela University. Let's welcome them with a round of applause.
Round of applause. Beautiful sounds from Wow, beautiful sounds uh, from uh, the Nelson Mandela University Choir. Um, it's a befitting way to welcome our guests today. Uh, I know both of them are people who take pride in our history, uh, people who are very appreciative of the journey that we've walked as a country and I know that they are pleased. Uh, that's something, in t an internationally acclaimed choir that's known everywhere around the world for its music and its diversity. Uh, once again, round of applause for them. <laughs> Housekeeping quickly, just to let you know the program is being broadcast live on our social media platforms. So you want to be at your most behaved state at every time because you don't know when the camera will be looking at focusing on you. Uh, we've got just for housekeeping as well, on my left, on your right, they are the ladies. And then on my right, the gents bathroom. Without wasting any time, let's welcome Ingwai Yalapa, Umama, and Professor Sbongile Mutwa to welcome us. TV now when I'm talking to you. Mm. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for that. Uh, and thank you to our talented choir.
thank you very much, Steph. Uh, I, I just want to uh, start uh, by um, really uh, thanking uh, and just uh, recognizing this, this as, a, as great uh, to be able to meet here. Um, it is uh, 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 for the first time, uh, 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 sis, uh, sis Gloria and Bishop, that uh, this year we are beginning to come back and to uh, to be together as the as the university uh, after doing so much uh, on um, online. So uh, this is one. In fact, it is the first uh, inaugural lecture uh, that we are doing. Uh, uh, in, in person, face to face, in hybrid form as well. So uh, it is a very, very uh, 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 a sense of joy for, for me. Uh, I have been uh, allowed by our program director to speak while I'm sitting down, uh, and, um, and which is as well, because we're just stuck on the lift <laughs> <laughs> just now, uh, uh, the DVC for research and okay. innovation and internationalization, there was no innovation there. <laughs> <laughs> she praised like seven floors, and then the, the button was all red. And then I said, this is supposed to be a scientist, you know. And then uh, and the, and the dean, who is our host, who were in there, and our guests were all the four of us. So we nearly did not have this event. It was more than two minutes, Bishop, wasn't it? <laughs> So, uh, and then I was um, feeling faint. <laughs> I was feeling faint and I, I had to lean on the archbishop. <laughs> and, then, and then Tandy uh, was delighted <laughs> to see me vulnerable. <laughs> so, so uh, we are very lucky to be here. <laughs> um, so uh, I would like to, to take this opportunity to, to welcome uh, U Mamu Sirobe, Dr. Gloria Sirobe, our guest speaker for this evening. To me, she needs no introduction. I don't know about you. Uh, I have uh, been able to work with uh, uh, Dr. Sirobe for a long time over the years when I was still in government. She always uh, is uh, such a strong advocate of a public good and public leadership. Uh, so uh, in all those years when I was a, a DG, in so many ways uh, she was involved uh, in my work and the work of, of government because in this uh, province of ours, we do not need the formal structures uh, of government only. We need uh, the activism of civil society from all levels and of business so, uh, uh, Sis Gloria, uh, even though she is quite a successful business uh, person, a leader, she is known uh, among our communities, among the most vulnerable uh, 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 people to be the activist uh, of development uh, who turns uh, precarity into in, inter, in enterprises so, uh, and taking along the, the, the poor people on the ground. So that is, that is really her brand uh, that we know in the Eastern Cape. I don't know what people know in Johannesburg. <laughs> uh, uh, His Grace, uh, the Archbishop uh, Tabo Mahuba, and I'm not going to waste time about the bishop as well. Bishop and I went to university together. And then Bishop is a scientist. He studied BSc, actually, before he went to the clergy. So uh, Bishop and I, we, we, uh, Archbishop, we live at Glen Thomas House as young students. So uh, it's been um, quite a, a journey, for me at least, uh, to uh, uh, my, 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 my fellow uh, colleague as a student uh, turned my Archbishop. <laughs> uh, so uh, I've had to revise uh, my relationship with the Archbishop uh, uh, over the years, and I was reminding the Archbishop uh, uh, just earlier on a story uh, uh, when I last saw him, when I first saw him after I left Vets and went to work uh, 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 for a few years and then went to, to, to study in London. 
uh, and then uh, I was at SOAS, so I came back uh, to do uh, uh, my research, my field work, at, uh, uh, and I was based at VETS. Uh, at VETS, they gave me the office in the Department of Sociology, uh, Babalwa. And then uh, I, um, I was uh, working there, uh, uh, res doing research in Soweto and, and based there. And then uh, we used to live late at night, like every a good PhD student does. <laughs> and as I was reversing my little car out of the parking, I could see that there is a priest also reversing their car, and I nearly knocked them down. <laughs> And then I stepped out of my car because I said that priest look familiar. But uh, I mean, I squinted again, and then there is Tabo, sorry, Archbishop, to call, you, <laughs> to call you that. And then because I had not known what had happened to him, uh, that he had gone to the clergy, uh, and then uh, I said, what are you doing wearing a collar? <laughs> So, so I was reminding him of that story. Of course, uh, uh, the rest is history, because then uh, I went to Fort Hare as an academic uh, myself, a young uh, uh, academic, and um, before I went to government. And then uh, 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 um, uh, Archbishop Tabo was uh, moved to Queenstown, and, uh, and then uh, moved to become the Bishop of Cramstown. And then you can see how uh, uh, our relationship uh, was revised uh, because he's, uh, he, is the, he is the Archbishop uh, of the Anglican Church in Southern Africa. So uh, uh, I, I, I just want to, to, uh, to, 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 to just uh, say something about uh, the personal relationship and the journey that uh, I, I've had uh, with, the Arch, with the Archbishop. Uh, uh, um. So it's a pleasure. Thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you. And a privilege. Uh, I also want to recognize, uh, and I'm going to be faster now, Ongama, uh, so don't uh, uh, worry. Uh, uh, I don't do long speeches, as you know, but I just thought I need to take a bit of time because the two uh, eminent colleagues that are here, I actually happen to know them very well. Um, uh, Bishop Eddie Daniels is in our uh, audience. I can see him there, the Bishop of Port Elizabeth. I don't know if now we call it a... a, a um, uh, in, in church. I don't, I don't think things change that fast in church. Uh, so uh, the Bishop of, of, of Port Elizabeth, who is also, who was also, uh, before he became a bishop, he was just my priest here at St. Margaret. Uh, 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 so it's, it's really lovely to see you here, uh, Bishop uh, Daniels. But also the bishop is our alumnus uh, because he got uh, his uh, doctorate here at this university in 2006. Uh, and I want to recognize all the faith-based members of the, of the audience that are here, uh, our deputy vice chancellors uh, that are here, uh, 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 um, Professor Kiet, Dr. Mgwebi, uh, I understand Mr. Hashatse, uh, uh, all our DVCs, the three DVCs are here, I've not seen Cheryl, uh, so the three, at least, of our four DVCs are here, so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and uh, I want to just recognize other members of management that are here, uh, all our academics that are here, and then uh, the deans of faculty. I want to single out uh, Professor Masego. Uh, Professor Masego uh, actually um, takes her job very seriously. <laughs> And she gets very anxious uh, in the build up of uh, doing something because it needs to go very well. So uh, 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 thank you very much, Prof, uh, for, for being just so serious about everything uh, 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 around your, your, the public image uh, of the university. Uh, and uh, so I want to, to, to thank you for that and to thank the members of your faculty as well uh, that, uh, that support you. And then I want to recognize all our colleagues from our university that are here and that are participating online and all our sister universities and the community uh, of this uh, Nelson Mandela Bay Metro uh, uh, in whose name uh, we exist. Uh, the president of the SRC and the SRC, our students, especially the winner of the essay on values-based leadership who will be announced later this evening. Uh, good afternoon and good evening to you all. It is indeed my privilege to welcome you to the inaugural Nelson Mandela 
University Archbishop Tabo Mahuba Development Trust annual public lecture on values-based leadership. This is a Faculty of Humanities hosted public lecture as the Ongama has uh, in, uh, um, reminded us that will be delivered by our very own Dr. Gloria Sirobe in conversation with our young scholars in the Faculty of Humanities uh, in the Department of Public Administration and Leadership. I'm really proud to say our own because uh, it was only in 2021 that uh, Dr. Sirobe accepted the honor uh, of uh, being um, our honorary doctor. Uh, uh, it was conferred, uh, uh, the, this degree was conferred in, to her uh, uh, last year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Dr. Sirobe, in recognition of her wide ranging uh, achievements in business, uh, uh, in women's empowerment, and in community building, uh, uh, as that is just how I summarize her, her uh, decorated career. We are honored that Archbishop Tabo Mahuba, Mrs. Lungi Mahuba, whom I also know quite well, uh, their family and the Development Trust considered us, Nelson Mandela University, uh, to be fitting to host this annual lecture, thus enabling us to reflect on value-based leadership, a subject that is important for all organizations of conscience. And then organizations of conscience, I could uh, take a long time talking to this, uh, but I'm just going to summarize organizations of conscience, hoping that we all know those kinds of organizations, and, uh, and an undertaking that is especially resonant at this critical time in our country. This is the subject, of course, of values-based leadership, and this subject is also very important for the world generally in, in terms of where we find ourselves. Globally, the world seems to be entering a dark period where moral and ethical leadership is truly needed. As the only university colleagues to bear the name of Nelson Mandela, we understand the responsibility that comes with bearing this name and our obligation to animate uh, through our develop deployment of academic project the principles and values of our iconic namesake. Guided by our Vision 2030 strategy, Nelson Mandela University strives to be a socially embedded university in the service of society. We affirm seriously our critical leadership role as a transformative and transformational university. In recent times, it has become increasingly clear that universities need to reflect deeply on and re-articulate their public good roles. If we are to rise to the challenge uh, of being an embodiment of knowledge as a force for good, we need to create platforms to engage in courageous conversations on what it means to lead society from a values-based poise or from a values-based comportment or deportment. In this regard, the university has a particularly special convening, as I call it, convening role to reinforce these engagements beyond the confines of classroom encounters, as important as these might be. I am confident that this lecture this evening will stimulate thought and debate by young people in particular on the principles of values-based leadership and why this is important to inculcate in order to build humane and accountable organizations and institutions for a better world. It is my firm conviction that we cannot talk about ethical leadership if, in others if we do not model it in ourselves. One of the strategic pillars of our Vision 2030 strategy is ethical governance and leadership. This rests on our uh, core values uh, as the university. Uh, our core values are the following. Uh, excellence, integrity, Ubuntu, respect for diversity, social justice and equality, and sustainable stewardship. Archbishop, uh, as I move to conclude, we thank you for this partnership with our university and the endowment from the Archbishop Tabo Mahuba Development Trust that will allow us to host these lectures annually. I also want to express deep gratitude to Archbishop Tabo for being here in person tonight. 
In closing, let me again welcome uh, my respected sister, our respected and decorated guest speaker, Dr. Gloria Sirobe, and thank you, ma'am, for agreeing to deliver the talk and for your willingness to join in this conversation, particularly with our young uh, emerging scholars. Uh, and then you know that uh, I, I uh, spend a lot of uh, my mental energy uh, 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 building uh, for the time when we are not here at university. So for me, uh, young scholars and students uh, are of particular importance in my crucible uh, in leading this uh, university. I am sure the attendees here this afternoon or this evening will have seen from the invitation Dr. Sirobe's many achievements and accolades, which should be an inspiration to us who are proud of this association as Nelson Mandela University men. I also want to take this opportunity again to thank our Executive Dean of Humanities, Professor Pamela Masego and her team for so promptly uh, seizing the offer of the partnership with the Archbishop Tabo Mahuba Development Trust. I see this as part of our overall initiative to revitalize the humanities at Nelson Mandela University, a cause, of course, which is very close to my heart. It is my hope that not only will this annual public lecture ripple outwards in society, but that will serve as a continual challenge to the university to ensure that our focus and priorities remain driven, driven by value-based leadership. Now, without any further ado, let me hand over again to the program director so that they can get uh, the important part of this evening started. You are all very welcomed. It is my hope that you will have an enjoyable uh, evening. Thank you very much. From our commander, our mama, our leader, um, beautiful words that need not to be repeated. Uh, you got me there, Prof, because I was given a strong brief to manage the time. And just when I was wondering, when is your commander speaking? <laughs> Do you stand? Uh, and then Prof said, uh, I'm mindful of the time, Ongama. And I was like, at least from a performance management point of view, I'm covered by that comment. Um, but also, Prof, on a serious note, you've, 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 you've dealt with another aspect of the program, the introductions. And I'm happy that you did them in a very wonderful personal uh, touch way. And we got introduced to both of our speakers in an amazing way we could not have done by reading the very profound uh, uh, bios that we've been able to secure. So I'm not going to waste time. We're going to go straight to the remarks by Archbishop Tabo Mahoba. Over to you, Archbishop. Thank you so much, Program Director, uh, members of the university community, uh, Director and Vice Chancellor, Professor Sbongile Motua, uh, our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Gloria Sirobe, who uh, is also a trustee member of the uh, Archbishop Tabo Makhova Development Trust. If I miss my lines, you must know that I'm sitting next to my boss here. <laughs> Um, Deputy Vice Chancellors, Deans, um, Professor Annalyn Dry, Dr. Amin Jak Jakut Sali, Ms. Praise Ramaru, and Mr. Musikama Mokhele, and uh, Bishop Eddie Daniels, and uh, all our esteemed guests, uh, students, friends, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, b before I say these brief, really brief uh, uh, remarks, uh, the VC uh, for, forgot to say when we were stuck in the lift, um, because I come from the uh, what we call the word industry. Uh, so the, there was a clear voice there that says, "Be calm. Help, help is on its way." <laughs> 
So I was, I was very calm, um, <laughs> VC. So good afternoon and welcome to this lecture. It is wonderful to be here with you at this uh, prestigious university, and I'm deeply grateful to the university for hosting this lecture for the very first time. My task tonight is very simple, and it won't take me long to perform it. Before um, you listen to uh, the person that uh, indeed uh, we have all come to listen to, as a trustee of the Archbishop Tower Mahoba Development Trust, I'm here to tell you briefly about the trust and what the purposes of the trust and lecture are. Uh, we, the Makoba family and other trustees, uh, launched the trust in 2012 as a small grant-making body uh, to deal with some of the legacies of our past. Its formation has its roots in the needs expressed on a daily basis uh, to me by individuals and community projects. People who write to me as Archbishop or show up at the gates at Bishop's Court asking for assistance. So the nature of those needs has influenced the trust funding strategy and its choice of beneficiary in grant making. So the three legacy areas of the trust are food security, social justice, and education. Over the last five years, the trust has made a significant impact in these areas as we have extended support to individuals, institutions, and communities to pursue their educational and development, developmental goals with a special focus on those in financial distress. So this lecture falls in the legacy area of education and the promotion of social justice. It is one of the seven lectures that the Trust sponsors, the Nelson Mandela being the latest edition, of course, and also at the University of Limpopo, the university at which I first studied, at Rose University, where I also studied later, and where my wife Lungi's father was a renowned anthropologist, at the University of Mpumalanga, the University of the Western Cape, Fort Hare University, and Walter Sisulu University. We're still in negotiation with the University of uh, Lesotho. Again, my warm thanks, uh, VC and Professor Maseko, and to our esteemed speaker uh, and, and leader and uh, boss, and uh, to the university for partnering with the trust in establishing the pla this platform for dialogue. I look forward to robust engagement tonight on a topic that is vital to our future. I thank you. A wonderful round of applause, yes, indeed. Wonderful speeches, and, 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 and for me, I'd like to remind you that there are, there's an audience out there that has to hear whether it's those three focus areas of the trust in terms of legacy areas. So take a photo, put it out on Twitter, put it out on Facebook. We're going to spread the message wider. The motto of this university is change the world, and you never know what gets to trigger somebody to change the world. So please, let's spread the message out there. Thank you so much, Bishop. We're now going to be changing in terms of the focus of the program. Uh, we're going to um, uh, get into the conversation. And at this stage, I'd like to thank you, release the distinguished guest, the boss of the boss of the boss of my boss, uh, Dr. Siubongile uh, Mutwa. You please remain, ma'am, because we're going to be coming to you now and Bishop. Another round of applause for them. Thank you. And at this stage, I'd like to invite the uh, moderator for the conversation with Dr. Gloria Sirobe. Uh, I, I love uh, Dr. Sirobe so much because one of the impactful projects in the Eastern Cape, in fact, the biggest agricultural project in the Eastern Cape is run by yours truly, and it's making great impact in the province. But let me not steal the thunder of Professor Annalyn Dry. Please, let's welcome her as she's going to facilitate the next session.
Executive Management, Council Members, Executive Dean, the mic says that. Um, Madam VC, Executive Management, and Council Members, Executive Dean Prof Maseko, Archbishop Makoba, Family, family and members of the Trust, Dr. Sir Robert, good afternoon, honorable guests, and welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sir Robert to a conversation on value leadership. Dr. Sir Robert is one of nine children. His glorious father is originally from Sentani, Eastern Cape, and left to work to find work in Cape Town in the early 1900s. Although he set up um, home in Cape Town, he never wanted his children to forget they hailed from the Eastern Cape, where all his siblings remained. To this end, Gloria was schooled at St. John's College in Mtata, and all an all-boys school in those days. She quickly learned how to hold her own in a male-oriented environment. She had to develop a staunch, hardy resilience and to do everything she could, could to be on top of her class. She learned how to survive in a place where people didn't think you belonged. It was about holding on to the intellectual best of yourself. This became her fighting equipment later. This certainly laid an, an, an important foundation for her business dealings later in life. She went on to obtain a BCom degree from the University of Transkei and holds an MBA degree from Rutgers University, New Jersey, USA. She's a founding member <laughs> and the chief executive officer of Whiphold, the first woman-owned company to be listed on the JSE in 1999. Community engagement. <laughs> community engagement is at the heart of all project investments Gloria and the Whiphole team initiate. In March 2020, President Cyril Ramaphosa announced the formation of the Solidarity Response Fund, which Gloria has headed as chairman throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. She's an honorary member of the Actuarial Society of South Africa and is a member of the SAIS Advisory Council. Ladies and gentlemen, I kindly invite Dr. Serobe to share her insights on value leadership with us. And later, we'll have a conversation with Dr. Serobe. Over to you, Dr. Serobe. of a pastor so I stand that's what I do um, thank you very much uh, colleagues I was looking forward to coming here for many reasons uh, Eastern Cape is my playground uh, when I want to have my head down when I feel more safe it is here um, especially with the kind of name you've got uh, it's a big name and so you come it was called Shukindbe in order because this is Nelson Mandela University. Thank you very much. It's an honor, really. Thank you very much, Professor Maseko, uh, for making it possible for me to be here. Um, the Most Reverend Archbishop and Mrs. Lungima Khoba, the Chancellor, uh, Dr. Geraldine Fraser Mugeleketi. The Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Sbong Lemotua, Ambassador Nosbo Badil, Chairman of the Council, the Executive Management Committee and Council members, fellow graduates and students. Um, thank you really for giving me this opportunity uh, to converse uh, with you on this important topic of value based uh, leadership and the rewards it brings. That this is the inaugural Archbishop Tabo Mahoba uh, annual public lecture also signifies a huge honor for me, being a trustee of the Development Trust, Incorporated 
10 years ago by the most reverend Archbishop and Mrs. Makoba. May the fruits uh, of your generous endeavors yield much more than you ever thought. One of the interesting objectives of this trust is the development of uh, ethical and moral leadership in Southern Africa. Thank you very much, Your Grace, for your visionary leadership of the Anglican Church in South Africa, in Southern Africa. But I wish to thank you specifically for providing the spiritual leadership uh, at the height of COVID and heavy lockdowns when the pandemic challenged our faith to the extent and there was nowhere to go worship. We really thank you because you tried to improvise, to fill that gap. And here we are. Thanks, God. According to a variety of authors, value-based uh, leadership is the idea that uh, leaders should draw upon their own and other values, including those established for organizational direction and motivation. Life is full of opportunities to create, cultivate, serve, develop, and lead. Being brought up in a God-fearing home and community, we have been taught from a very early age how to manage the fundamental tension at the heart of all humans, which is the power for good against the potential to harm. At its core, value-based uh, leadership philosophy asserts that people are mostly motivated by values and live according to these beliefs. While the main purpose of any business is to deliver shareholder value, positive actions must be felt by the rest of society in order to live a better world for the next generation. To give context to my own value-based uh, leadership over a long time, I have to confess here that I'm 62 years old, so it's a very long time. I would therefore like to share some of my background which informed my own behavior in life. I do have a spiritual background growing up under a pastor grandfather. In the 1920s, my grandfather, Reverend John Zamilin Dallas, was a highly respected pastor based in Cape Town. He had seven children with his wife, who unfortunately passed on quite early in his life when he was only 49 years old, leaving behind seven children ranging from three months to 13 years. He single-handedly raised these seven small children, one of which was my mother. He did this while at the same time he was building the National Baptist Church in Southern Africa with his area of responsibility covering the Western Cape, Eastern Cape, and parts of KZN. His seven children were to later contribute to him Listen to the number, 35 grandchildren, of which I am one of them. The challenges of life were such that we too were brought up by him, and again, almost single-handedly. I'll come back to this chapter of my life, except to say for now, I am in awe of this great man. Being a pastor's grandchild, meant exactly that. You had to be the first one in church. You will agree, Ash Bishop. Neat, properly combed, with poppy socks. Active in the church choirs, whether you can sing or not. The visiting priests were made coffee, tea, and scones or biscuits by you, because you are hoping for the leftovers the Bible readings, the Sunday school responsibilities, and so on and so on. 
The burden of being a pastor's grandchild meant you could not be an example of wrongdoing. The idea that you could show up in church long after Osiak Dumis and has been done was unthinkable. Added to this burden for us, our school results, good or bad, were read out loud in church. We were then to learn later though in our adult life that this was not meant to humiliate us, but it was rather meant to affirm us that early in life. Effectively, when you were at school, you knew that these results are going to be right in church. You didn't want to be in that wrong space. But the most overwhelming benefit of this was that we were mothered and fathered by the congregation. The love, the support, the prayers, the discipline. The big prayers by all before you get to that three-day journey by train from Cape Town to the boarding schools in the Eastern Cape gave you the confidence that nothing can go wrong in this hazardous journey. When in fact you are only a 13-year-old unmanned child in a three-day train trip. And so our characters as children were built by the church and these communities. We were groomed from a young age to be upright citizens. We were expected to, give, to keep the good name of the society. We were the pride and joy of our small community. And so, so much was expected out of us. Everything we did was always followed by, will it pass the test? Even as adults, as we started to play in the global stage, the possibility of being in the front page of the newspaper for wrong reasons, the ultimate test is whether you can face umamundamo, umamunzugwa, umamungab, they are no longer alive. You just see their faces. And you just, I can't, can't get there. And so in my book, uh, I know that there will be scholars on governance here and write a lot of papers. But in my book, governance is less of the clauses and the clauses and the principles, King Four and all of that. But it's more of how your parents and the community brought you up. We all know, thou shalt not steal. You don't need King Four for this. And so the characteristics of value-based leadership for me, I've summarized them into five. One is the authenticity. The second one is excellence. The third one is inclusivity. The fourth one is morals and ethics and governance. And then the fifth one is spirituality and Christian values. If I then go to the first one, authenticity, I'm going to refer you then to my rural life in Tendane. My grandfather was one of four children, the family based in Tendane, a small poor rural town next to Butter within the Eastern Cape. He's the only one of the four siblings to leave Glendane as he headed for Cape Town to look for work. The rest of his siblings remained in Glendane. This made him keen to ensure we don't forget that we actually come from this part of the world. Even though he spent the rest of his life in Cape Town and all his children and grandchildren were born in Cape Town. He was quite deliberate about this aspect of our lives, which would later form a big part of my responses, my responses to life. Myself, personally, all my schooling ranges from Glendane to Clarkbury and to St. John's in Umtata for high school. This confirms that I am just as deeply dipped in this rural Eastern Cape, and understand the nuance and the deep meaning of its poverty. 
I do have cultural influences from this experience. There's a hidden rich history in Gendane. But it is swallowed by its pronounced poverty such that it required some heavy lifting to show to the rest of the world. And so some three highlights that will help reflect on how this little town later also influenced me. We've just heard the wonderful uh, Lizal Sitting Alako song by the choir, written by Reverend Tiosoka, a pronounced scholar and the author of that song and many other things that he wrote. He was the first African to go to school. He is buried in this little town of mine. He qualified in theology at the University of Glasgow in 1854, and he died in 1871 at the age of only 42. And so the poverty of this unknown town is such that the history of this very famous scholar is not well documented. Interesting enough, his firstborn son became the first qualified black doctor in South Africa in 1883. He also studied at the University of Glasgow. His son, the son of that son, Alexander, followed in his footsteps and qualified as a doctor in 1912. It was not until the 1940s that South Africa admitted blacks into medical schools. You will notice that the old doctors, uh, Dr. Kumas, Dr. Um, Roka, they all come from that part of the world because only until 1940 were blacks admitted to medical school. The last point about Soga, and I'm emphasizing on him because he's related to this important place. His one son, Dr. Jotelo Festeri Soga, became the first South African of all races to receive a degree in veterinary medicine in 1886 from the University of Edinburgh. He came back home and helped eradicate Rina Pest, a highly contagious and fatal cattle disease that almost decimated South Africa's cattle stock. The next veterinary science doctor to qualify was 26 years later, in 1912. So there are many stories, and I will end there, because even on now, it happened in Tendane. Uh, for those who know, it's an infamous story, but it's a story, by the way. That brings me to the second characteristics of uh, value-based leadership. Excellence. I will start with excellence in education. For my junior degree, I went to Walter Sewell University and did a BCom. It happened to be at the same time in 1978 that Professor Wiseman Gutlu headed up the accounting department. He had just become the first black chartered accountant in South Africa and he epitomized for me and us the best and the brightest of what could be achieved. Even though I hadn't put much stock in accounting as a profession, coming as I did from a maths and science school, he first became my role model and completely changed my mind. After graduating and qualifying as a CA, Professor Nkutlu quickly realized the importance of fostering con continued interest in the accountancy profession amongst black South Africans. And so he returned to teach at the university while also running an accounting firm from which the next set of CAs came from this accounting firm. He, he, I, I mention him specifically because it's going to take one person to change the whole system. And for me, he was. 
He was later to show his ethical leadership again. When he came back from his retirement some four years ago, to lead the redemption of the accounting profession, which was severely damaged during the state capture. He became the chairman of KPMG to bring back the honor of the accounting profession again. So Archbishop, you hear me using the word redemption? I'm sure you think about Jesus Christ and sacrificing the issue here is that uh, Professor Nkutlu, at the risk of his own reputation, came back from retirement to bring back the honor of the accounting profession to where it was. And we have to just give a round of applause for that. He did that <laughs> with gusto. Then we have excellence in leadership. Excellence has got to guide you in everything you do. The scope for failure has got, to be, has got to be limited. This is more so in South Africa as we try to navigate our way out of this untold damage the apartheid system inflicted on us, including those it was meant to benefit. We have to compete with the rest of the world for the same investment capital. We want to be the preferred destination for investment capital decisions. And so this democratic government inherited a bankrupt South Africa in 1994. In credit rating terms, South African government was a junk status, something no country ever wants to experience. As the deputy president, Tabombeki, he had the responsibility as a head of business and government to fix this, the big drag on the country balance sheet was the state-owned enterprises led mainly by Transnet, which was expected to turn around the economic fortunes of the country as all the economic infrastructure were in that stable, the railways, the ports, the pipelines, the airlines. As the finance director of Transnet from 1996, to 201, the instructions from Pretoria were very clear and unambiguous. We have to provide relief to the state by fixing transnet balance sheet and reduce the dependency from the state, including offloading those government guarantees from the government balance sheet. To do this, we had to act with such precision and military precision for that matter with proper guidance and clear leadership from government. President Mbeki's obsession with excellence meant that there was no opportunity for mediocrity. And so our proudest moment was that seven years later, in 2001, South Africa was declared an investment grade triple B2. It took seven years for this government to take itself out of that junk status to being an investment grade. For this to happen, the leader must demonstrate this level of excellence to get the best out of the people you lead. At this point, I have to acknowledge uh, Sakima Tozoma, who was the MD of Transnet at the time. While he had the responsibility to turn around the fortunes of Transnet, he also made sure that we were protected from any form of interference, especially political interference. He took the beating for us, he cushioned us, he sheltered us. He just wanted us to do what has got to be done and take the fallout, if there is, from the political nuances. We have to thank him. In fact, when I looked and I read the state capture, I actually see in some cases just how the leaders of some of these professionals did not protect them from this madness. It could have not gone that way. They left them to their devices. I have to confirm that in my five years in transit, I never had a call from Pretoria to do something funny. 
my calls were only going to come from Sagi. And if there were funny conversations, he kept them there to himself and didn't bother to tell us. Value-based leadership consistently and creatively lived out, sees transformation in every sector of business and the community. We want to be a part of increasing the pool of the next generation's abilities and equipping them to be able to focus on solutions to societal problems. I have to come to excellence at home. This is going to be very strange. Marriage is the most underestimated place to be seen as a source of a value system. I do want to change that. I am now 35 years married to the most gorgeous man. <laughs> oh my word, I hope he's not listening. Um, and God willing, I do hope, uh, till death do us part, will be the case, hopefully not time too soon. Marrying into a home led with conviction and strong morals by the mother-in-law of my mother-in-law, you did hear me, mother-in-law of my mother-in-law, I found clarity in this hierarchy of leadership of who is in charge. My grandmother-in-law had mentored as a labor of love my mother-in-law when she married into the Sorobe family at a young age of 21. The baiting to lead this family with integrity and faith was passed from mother to mother when that time came for each one to pass on. Myself being young when I got married, I found this value chain of leadership immensely empowering. It is my grandmother-in-law who gave me my marriage name, Mahoto. Had my mother-in-law been alive when my son got married in 2014, she would have been the one giving my daughter-in-law her marriage name, Malarato. So the succession plan meant I had to do it. There is expectation when you marry into these families that you will build a home and value add to make it a better home. And so to have these matriarchs showing me the ropes how to build a loving family and home and maintain the family traditions and faith, the succession was deliberate. And so when my mother-in-law passed on in 2013, I was ready and well-groomed to take on this role for the next generation. I am doing my best to do the same to my daughter-in-law. Perhaps what my late mother-in-law taught me the most was the important value of commitment to community work. In my case as Makoti, Nyakoti is like those who have been in Makoti, you know what that means. That got Zamna with her community work. Whether it is a blind association, Kaheng, Black Consumer Union, and so on, my presence as Makot was expected. In the process, I ended up benefiting from being groomed, not only by her, but the style was like Oma Kuzwa, Oma Sisul, Oma Ninoni. They were all mothers now. I was just a Makoti for all these stalwarts. In the end, they carry you and make you a better person. So for those who are thinking of getting married, please do it. But just take, give attention to this little matter of relationship with the mother-in-laws. It is meant to build and not the other way around. The third pillar of value-based leadership is inclusivity. Our history of exclusion and its devastating effect on, mass, on most sectors of our country is very well documented. To bring about crucial change, we must be very decisive and deliberate about being inclusive in every decision we make. As a professional, I have had the privilege of working during the apartheid regime and also during 
the new democratic regime. The apartheid system was very sophisticated on, on implementing and monitoring how to effectively exclude all manners of groupings of people, particularly black and women. They applied their best brains to make sure this is achieved with all the precision in the world. And so to undo this untold damage, some of it now permanently irreversible, we have to use our best of intellectual capacity to innovatively untie these apartheid knots. It's going to take a long time. But because I know firsthand what it means to be excluded, overtly and subtly, my first response is always going to be, have we given access to everyone? This is whether it is regarding WePold or the COVID Solidarity Fund or any developmental issue for that matter. Women have been the biggest victims of this exclusion when in fact they are a great gift from God. That must be honored and celebrated. Back to the Archbishop Mahoba Development Trust of which I am greatly honored to be a trustee of. It is punching above its weight to highlight the values of solidarity with women in food security, social justice, and in education. These public lectures have in the main brought voices of women speakers to inspire, shape, and transform university spaces to be social spaces that build a social capital that says women's voices are unique and so are their experiences. The four founders of WIPHOLD, Louisa Mugela, Wendy Luhabe, Nomle Tabashi, and myself, had this in mind when we decided to establish it 28 years ago in 1993. Women had to be put in the mainstream of the economy instead of just being consumers and providing labor. It had to be all women of all colors, simply based on the fact that the exclusion of women in the economy is a worldwide phenomenon, not just blacks. 28, 28 years later, this is one of the BE companies from those earlier years that has remained in operation and has occupied the key sectors of the economy, including financial services, cement industry and agriculture. We were deliberate about these sectors because they are known to reject women as economic players. I will go to the fourth uh, one, morals, ethics, and governance. It stands firm as another pillar of value-based leadership. Our high levels of moral standards, ethics, and commitment to governance it's what keeps these organizations we lead sustainable. It has got to be that the integrity in our system must not be contaminated by our lapses in, government, in governance. We have to give attention to these issues of accountability, especially and even especially if we are dealing with public resources and we are trusted custodians. Solidarity Fund, which was established in March 2020 as a rapid response fund to the COVID pandemic, is a great example of the need for this strong value system. Announced by the president as a platform to augment the work of government as a way dealing with this still unknown disease, it became a platform to which South Africans and their international allies support their support to assist government with this challenge. Over 300,000 individuals, so many organizations, responded with their financial resources and human resources pro bono and segments to assist on this difficult work. At some stage, I had over 400 people under me. From the poorest to the richest, they contributed their hard-earned resources. COVID did not discriminate. The poor, the wealthy, the rural, the urban, men or women, black or white, 
It cut across the board. The challenge of the fund was to make sure we address all these victims of COVID. I had the greatest honor of being the chairman of this high quality and diverse board of the Solidarity Fund. At this point, I have to acknowledge uh, Professor Maseko and VC, the role Professor Lungle Pepeta played in the space. Because I was not a doctor, I had to protect myself with the best brains in the industry. And I started with him. I also needed him to help me localize COVID in the Eastern Cape space. And he did that with a lot of energy. The one time I spoke to him, he spoke funny and I asked him, why are you speaking so funny? And he just laughs. He says, I'm in a CPAP because I got COVID. I'm in hospital. Uh, but if you don't find me, uh, please talk to Dr. Nomvet. Something, I, I think it's Dr. Nomvet, right? I guess a few days later, he was right. I must talk to Dr. Nomvet because he was normal. To make sure there are no governance lapses while at the same time we needed to be agile and act quick in a crisis mode, the board had to meet weekly for the 18 months at the height of COVID. It meant the executives and the war room must meet every day to be ready for submissions to subcommittees of the board to be able to present to the board every Thursday. And so no one had the excuse to act outside of their delegations of authority because the board was available weekly. And so to choose a sad situation like COVID and find the space for corruption while South Africans are grappling with this massive challenge of the largest proportions is beyond immoral and seriously unethical and borders on sickness. I think as Gloria Tomato, I have to say today, I must denounce strongly those we know and those we do not know who found this unfortunate event to be an opportunity to steal the little bit South Africa had to protect its citizens from this COVID war. Finally, Spirituality and Christian values is key to value-based uh, leadership. I was mindful that uh, we will be sitting with the Archbishop in the room. But uh, I have the privileged background of coming from a home grounded in Christianity and a strong spiritual leader. This has anchored me positively in all manner of situations, no matter the circumstances. Leaders who have Christian faith and strong spiritually and entrenched in the community have a better chance of contributing to the well-being of the organizations they serve. One last point. The value-based leadership consistently and creatively lived out sees transformation in every sector of business and the communities it affects. The Weepol story is an interesting one, but I will not get into that. But in the end, we look like a contrarian business. Strong commercial, strong developmental, we feel obsessed about rural things, and we, we get irritated with exclusion, we just, sometimes we look political when we're just business. But the case in point is our involvement with agriculture in the Eastern Cape. While it was also a, com a commercial issue, we were dealing with something else there. The land in Eastern Cape is lying fallow, partly because they have no security of tenure. And so the funders' institutions cannot go there. They can't fund them. And so we went there to show that actually, you will. And the institutions are now able, have no excuse at least, not to go there. And the example we gave them was, 
if you can finance an aircraft, which is moving up there in the air, and you've been innovative of, on how to do it, you cannot have a reason not to finance a land which is fixed in a particular place. It will never move anywhere, simply because people have no title deeds. We have defied that. And the, the, the program that is talking about, we are the second biggest farmer in Eastern Cape now. And the maize from Willowvale, Gwendane, Eliodale, Mamakwe, is being sold internationally. <laughs> it only has to be grade one maize. And there's nothing that says rural Eastern Cape cannot produce grade one maize. Millers just want grade one maize. That's all it is. And so if you speak to the rural people of Tendana now, they will tell you that we sell our maize in the Chicago Stock Exchange. <laughs> <laughs> we feel very good about that. We feel very arrogant sometimes, I must say. I must conclude and say, the positive footprint left by value-based leadership, whether in the corporate, community, or private home space, is critical for the well-being and longevity of a prosperous and thriving country. When we temper our personal ambition and focus on doing good to our neighbors, instead of giving in to our desires to accumulate wealth, power, prestige, we cultivate and harvest gratitude joy, humility, in the opportunity to lead and serve. South Africa today is going through all sorts of major political and economic challenges and changes. And it demands of all of us, particularly leadership, to play a role in rearranging this socio-political system of our country and move it forward. The COVID-19 pandemic has deepened the very difficult economic space that we face. But I find it exciting to see how young, new, and already established leadership within business, communities, and homes are applying their faith, their intellectual and sterling capabilities to help self-correct our country. We all see the corruption, the failing municipalities, we see the harm that has been done. Value-based leaders are the nemesis of this corruption. And the last thing we all want, having spent so many years striving for true democracy and freedom for all, is to have our reputation as a country tarnished by not being completely ethical and professional. We were known to be number two in the audit auditing standards before the state capture, and we dropped to something like 45. And so when Professor Nkulu comes back to rearrange that, he wants to go back to number one, actually, not number two. And I hope in his lifetime he will see that. Understanding grace and accepting that while, us, while I'm eager to bring good to the world, I will invariably fall short of expectations and unwittingly disappoint others. But this humility allows me to freely offer grace with respect to others whose ambition or vision may be different from mine. A humble heart teaches tolerance. Let's follow the straight and narrow path of keeping the Ten Commandments. There are the fundamental rules for value-based leadership, which have stood the test of time and are guaranteed to lead to both personal and community success. Then too shall our country thrive and prosper for all. Thank you very much. Before we extend a hearty thank you to Dr. Sirobe, we will first invite an audio clip. Oh, 
is why so yet to go see see Essentially, all four of us were almost established professionally by 1993 and we felt some sense of responsibility as privileged black women to pioneer a revolutionary initiative that would enable less privileged women to participate in the unfolding economic landscape. And we set ourselves a number of objectives. The first one was to reclaim the financial independence of women on our own terms. The second one was to demonstrate that it was possible for women to take responsibility for their financial well-being. And the third one was to make a difference. I think the initial vision was a, quite a noble one, that of bringing women into the mainstream economy of the country. Uh, we took a view that as women we have been historically disadvantaged, needless to say that uh, we continue to be disadvantaged. That was first. Secondly, we also realize that uh, for WIPOLD to be able to achieve what we set out to achieve, uh, we needed to mobilize as many women as, as possible, particularly because the vision was that of uh, bringing women into the mainstream of economy. So if we were going to be handpicking few women, that wouldn't have been in line with uh, what our vision was. Thirdly, we also uh, realize that um, you cannot ignore the development of women in society because women are also a catalyst of uh, development in society and the only way to be able to develop women is expose them to issues such as uh, financial independence, how the economy functions, so on and so forth. So for me that was exactly what what, what was a hard core, what was what I saw as a vision of WIPOLD? Um, I guess we've, we've given all sorts of uh, reasons behind the formation, but I think uh, all of us in different forms, what we wanted was to actually demonstrate that uh, the women in South Africa can play in the mainstream of the economy as well and as good as their male counterparts. And uh, it was very important for us that it is done with all the uh, it, what is the word now? It must be as straight and as with the highest form of integrity because it was an experiment which was going against convention. And the last thing we needed was uh, the failures which are linked to things like fraud and corruption and so on, other than the normal business failures, which are to be expected in the kind of business that we get into. So we were kind of obsessed with, uh, with the, the trueness and the genuineness of it and the visibility of that change. Um, we did think that we, we are probably the catalyst for change in that sense. And to be a catalyst, you have to keep being the catalyst. I think lastly, um, there was a bit of emotion to it. There was a bit of emotion because we, uh, we had an idea that the whole world has not addressed this issue of women in business. And we are a small part of the world but we had an advantage of a new government and the transition 
which we could take advantage of and experiment with this thing. And maybe it is an experiment then that can be packaged to the world. So there was a lot of, uh, and, and, and the more we expanded the audience that will one day look at it, the more it was critical for us that it must pass any test of integrity, it must pass any test of governance, it must pass any test of legality. And, and first prize, it must pass any test of a huge success. Uh, we did think that women have got to make money uh, out of Sakharov because they deserve it. And uh, if it's a lot of money, wonderful. But if it uh, empowers women and disengages them from the whole problem of being a poor woman, uh, we wanted independence. We wanted them to be free of uh, of uh, control. There's too much control on women. And it's not only here, it's everywhere. But in South Africa, at least we can talk about uh, the more dependent women were on, on men, the more they were subjected to the punishment of men. Things like rape, violence against women, and those kinds of things. They tend to happen and get hidden because women are always thinking about if I report this, where do I live? Uh, can I divorce? Can I leave this? Can I will my children go to school? Or my social status? It's all of those things which we just kind of package them into this thing has got to succeed at all cost and it 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 must but it must have all the dignity of a woman who still wants to be a woman, but uh, must have a little bit of independence that she can live off. And so there is a bit of an equal existence, but not to such an extent. We still wanted to be wives, we still wanted to be pampered, we still wanted to afford flowers and jewelries and stuff like that but we also wanted to be able to say no if we don't think we should uh, take those gifts because sometimes those gifts are packaged to ill treatment sometimes they're packaged to uh, more control and so we kind of were struggling with a lot of things that's really what drove us we we had fun first of all yeah. We traveled throughout the country, probably went to places that we would have not have any reason to, to travel to. But we traveled to all nine provinces, conducted workshops and interacted with what I think must have been more than 2,000 women. And the, the purpose of these workshops were to educate women about the economy and how the economy works how they contribute to the economy and for them to understand that at that stage they were providing labor to the economy and they were consumers of the economy. But that there was another alternative that they could participate in the economy as investors and that that was really what was behind our vision. There were instances where we had to conduct the workshops in vernacular because we would have rural women in our audiences who couldn't speak English and it was important for us that people understood uh, the message and understood the opportunity that we were making available to, to women. What we did uh, in order to mobilize these women, because one of uh, the important uh, aspects of our vision was the one that we realized that uh, we would need to galvanize the purchasing power of women to use them again as a catalyst of uh, exactly what we wanted to achieve. And the only way for us to be able to do that, we realize that we will have to trip trace this whole country and just talk to about every woman, particularly because our vision was the one that was not uh, excluding any category of women. We just said women, whether you were rural women, whether you were domestic women, whether you were women, white women who may have previously been uh, uh, empowered we just said we'll talk to the whole array of women because we also realize uh, incidentally that
Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to ask um, that you extend a hearty thank you to Dr. Serobe for sharing her insights and her thoughts and her experiences at this stage. Please, can we put our hands together for a hearty, hearty thank you um, for the insight shared. At this stage, um, I'd like to invite my colleagues to come and honor Dr. Serobe with the conversation. Um, and we will engage on Bobby Sox, etc. <laughs> Please come. I invite Dr. Amina Yakutsali, Mr. Mosekame Mokele, and Ms. Praise Ramaru. And uh, my good colleague, Ongama, will help me keep time and uh, stay on the straight and narrow. Value-based le um, leadership is very timely where we find ourselves in our global village. It's also very timely where we find ourselves in South Africa, given occurrences in, in our own country. And so for this discussion, Dr. Sarobe, we are extremely grateful um, in bringing back our consciousness to the value-based principles that you've shared. Authenticity, excellence, inclusivity, morals and ethics and governance, spirituality, and Christian values. I think some of the aspects that I picked up from what you shared with us, firstly, is that these values that you shared dovetails with our own values that our VC has mentioned, that we so proudly share at our university, encapsulated in one concept, Ubuntu. I also take from your engagement, grooming, and my own dean has been very instrumental in putting together the team this evening to teach us going forward that we begin to groom this generation and in the next generation. And in the famous words of many a grandparent, we want better for you, and we want better for the next generation. And then lastly, expectation. The expectation we have of ourselves, the expectation we have of others, and the expectation we should have of the future. You mentioned it can take but one person to be that catalyst. And on that note, I would like to invite Amina Yakutsali to engage us with the first question. Good afternoon. Um, so Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Prof. Chai, for that introduction, and um, good afternoon to Dr. Sirobe. Um, firstly, I do feel honored to be part of the um, conversations this evening as part of the younger academics. So, um, without any further ado, my first question, not qu actually question, just starting the conversation, is um, Prof. Mutwa has already stated that one of the foundational values of our university is respect for diversity. And we prepare our graduates to be socially conscious. You, um, Dr. Sarobi, you have mentioned that authenticity is one of the values or one of the principles of value-based leadership with, make, with specific reference to what your grandfather, the values your grandfather inculcated in you in not forgetting where you come from. So how do you then um, apply these values and and that you've just spoken about 
and how do we appreciate the uniqueness of everyone, our students, our colleagues, how do we appreciate this uniqueness by treating everyone with respect in the workplace and in our daily lives? Thank you. So it works. Um, it, it's quite easy, actually. Uh, uh, this, uh, the sooner South Africans, as soon as they can, to travel the world, you will actually find we are the only ones who are uncomfortable with where we come from. If you are in a international room, quickly people revert back to their Swiss backgrounds, their German backgrounds, to their US backgrounds, to whatever, and Bavarian, uh, rural, you name it. The opposite for us, and why I stress the issue of Tendane uh, was that there was a time, at least during our time, where people did not want to be known to come from rural areas. They would even create stories. There are even horror stories of people disowning their mothers because they were wearing a duquen and all of that. Um, the, if somebody is from rural northwest, they would say they're from Johannesburg. And, and that has damaged us a lot. Because in the end, you are nothing. You are nobody now. You know you're not from Johannesburg. You know Johannesburg doesn't know you. But you are disowning the ones who will actually die for you. And so this authenticity thing is, 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 is meant to ground us first. Let's be comfortable with this thing. It is OK to come from Tendane. And the reason I was going on and on about this history and the depth and the wealth of this poor town was to actually say, actually, it was better to come from Tendane than to come from Cape Town. And this is what my grandfather was trying to do without saying it in so many ways. Of course, as you get older, you actually understand. And so, Personally, doesn't matter where I go to. Um, I, I hate to get into a room and people didn't notice I came in. Uh, I want people to notice that I am here. Yeah. And I am from Tendani. Yeah. yeah, you can ask me to help you pronounce it and I will happily do that. But don't shift me to Cape Town. That is the authenticity I'm talking about. So as you get into the big stage and you're fixing things and you're fixing the world, you've got to play that in your head. That actually, I am the only voice in this room for them. Let me do it. Uh, so I've just come from London uh, last week with the big fund managers. And of course, they don't know our rural life. You always have to throw it at them. So when there is floods, when there's floods, what you see in social media is a balito, umloti, and then you have to say, somebody's rondavel fell. Yeah. And that also has to be part of the intervention. That, in, that rondavel is the only thing they had. It's a mud house, it's probably 50,000 rands, help them build the rondavel. And of course, do the shelter. There's no shelter houses in the rural areas. So you find that they are sitting, they're staying next door in the next rendezvous, and it's going to take them years before they can accumulate money to build this rendezvous. So this authenticity thing is about, it's the only way we can shift South Africa. Thank you.
think the message is on claiming your space and acknowledging your heritage and standing proud in, in, in our heritage. And then tell the story, Babawa. My colleague always says, tell the story. Share the story about us so that future generations can build on the story and whence we came from. And so on that note, I will hand over to the next question, who is Ms. Praise Ramaru. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, I just want to follow up on what uh, my colleague Dr. Sally said. Here at Nelson Mandela University, we are working with different students, students who are coming from different places, students who have different backgrounds, students who have experienced a lot of horrible and painful trauma, students who have bad experiences, students who do not believe in community engagement, students who do not believe that they are going to be, the, they are going to be leaders in the future. So my question to Dr. Sirupe is, how can we continue to prepare our socially conscious graduates for the future, respecting the basic value systems that we have. Wow, okay. Uh, uh, interesting question. Um, so, we were five girls in a boys' school. And, and so the issue there is that you, you know you don't belong here, but you are here. Uh, we went there because of a scholarship that was taking the top 50 students in the country in medicine and science and quarantined them at St. John's for Matric. So the one thing we had was the arrogance of brightness. Oh, we knew that. Even the way we walked, we knew it. Um, why I'm mentioning that example is that in the diversity, everybody loves success. And they quickly uh, disengage from the, 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 the diversity uh, uh, chaos and, and, and discrimination. And so um, it is important that of course, we've got to use other instruments to help with the diversity problems, but I do think that our biggest role as a student amongst a diverse group of students is being known to be an authority on something and stamp your ground and up in the face of everyone. If you are top med students, people must know. By the time they know you come from Butterworth, they've known you to be an authority in maths. And so in a student environment, because it's that place, it's that playground for brains, you've got to give more to it to be that person who's known to be an authority of something. And that diversity conversation changes the color because they are talking to a top scientist. They are talking to a top historian. They are talking to somebody who's just comfortable uh, with themselves. At that point, they don't even want to know whether you're a vendor or you're a paid now or whatever. So I would just encourage that in a student space, because it's a place, you, you are sitting with people who are already processed. They want to be somebody and they have ambitions, they have pride, all of them, in all of their diversity. And the issue there is create the envy of being you by everybody else. And by the time you say, no, I'm Zulu, it's, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And so for our students here, and I think also for those of us are established, own your excellence, own your trade, own your craft, so that the diversity conversation can begin to change. And on that note, I'll hand over to Mr. Mokele. Kwasekama. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, to you, uh, Dr. Sarobe. 
Um, the question I have is derived from the point that you are a spiritual um, woman and also you are a professional woman. And in that instance that we're from a um, diverse community and we find ourselves in the workplace where we have different beliefs, then how can we integrate our own beliefs or spirituality as leaders without making our own spirituality superior over others? Because you find that in the, organi in the organizations, um, let's say um, we are 15, then 10, it, it's from a, uh, uh, a certain belief, uh, a spirituality and 15, or maybe this five, then it shares this, uh, a certain belief. Then as a leader, then you end up um, falling or favoring the majority of a belief. But how can we do that? We, in, in the issue of inclusivity, then we goes and we apply across everyone in the organization. Thank you very much. Archbishop. <laughs> um, South African Council of Churches is very good at this. Um, whether you are speaking to Archbishop Mahoba or your Bishop Bumlwana, they are very frantic about recognize all the beliefs, do the right thing. Um, because we, we, we come from different pockets. Uh, you will notice that uh, with the inauguration of the country, uh, it's deliberate. They play it right through. Um, so I would say in this case, um, let's learn from the leaders in this case. We are lucky at this point that they are very much alive to the diversity of these beliefs. And uh, I don't know if I'm wrong, Archbishop, but I would have loved you to answer this one because it's about helping uh, with the conversation because it's a very serious question that how do you balance uh, the belief uh, systems and in a diversified form, how do you make sure that it is, uh, it is addressed uh, in a way that everyone is comfortable because it's something they are very anxious about and they are never about. And but I've delegated upwards now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sorobe, and thank you for uh, that question. Um, you know, South Africa is very, very fortunate uh, in the sense that um, when we were um, maybe in the trenches fighting. Uh, we never asked, are you Jew, are you Muslim, are you Christian? Uh, we said, those in the household of faith know the right reasons. Uh, let us pursue the truth, that the truth will set us free. And are you a believer, are you not a believer? But you know, if something is not right and something is demeaning the other, it demeans you, then... Um, the, the hat of being a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, a African traditional a, a, a belief person, uh, really became a second order question. I think the first order question was, how do I treat uh, the next human being as reflecting the spark of the creator? The creator may be God, the creator may be Kamata, the creator may be somebody else. So I think that's what um, Dr. Zerobo is really highlighting that we, uh, we, we, we meet as religious leaders from time to time. There's the interfaith um, religious um, group in South Africa. Um, there is the ecumenical space. But the most important thing is how do we do good for each South African and how do we do it authentically? And, and the last story is I, uh, uh, sorry to, to pick uh, that one up, but um, it's, it's just a reminder of um, uh, uh, how important personal anecdotes are. Um, uh, Raymond Ackerman of Pick and Pay went to an Anglican school in, 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 in Cape Town, Bishops. And he says, I attended those chapel services and all those things, and I dragged myself 
But those chapel services at bishops made me a better Jew. <laughs> On that note, um, what I took from that is that we all have a higher power, but that in, in the engagement with our higher power, it should be for the greater good. I'm going to ask our program director, do we have time for perhaps one or two more questions? Awesome. Um, and on that note, I would just like to extend again a hearty thank you, firstly to Dr. Serobe for again sharing your thoughts, and also Dr. Serobe to our young academics. Um, they've been with us, at, um, praise, and Mosekama has only been with us for give or take a year, um, and they're very active in their own fields. And so we're very proud of them. And Dr. Amina Yakutsali is an active academic in her space as well. Thank you for uh, in allowing these questions and thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, a hearty thank you for this part of the program. Thank you. Another round of applause as they take their seats. It was a wonderful one. It's always amazing, I think, in uh, South Africa where you may, ma'am, yes. Uh, uh, are you gonna, Dr. Ngam, are you going to need uh, Dr. Sorobi up front? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, because I'm not going to be able to speak after my boss, has, my, the boss of my boss has spoken, um, I'd like to thank you from my side. It's been a wonderful time to be here with you. It was such an amazing thing to hear from the heartbeat of one of the movers and shakers in the country. I dare say the mover and shaker in the country. Yes. And in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that the, the, one of the, the two projects, so the project, one of the biggest, and then a uni, a alumnus of this university runs the, sec, the second biggest project, the Dalasile Agri-Park, uh, out also in the former Transkai. So we are changing the world indeed. Um, at this stage, I'd like to welcome uh, the boss of the boss of my boss, uh, the dean, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Professor Pamela Maseko, who is going to be presenting first the, 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 the a student with a winning essay on value-based leadership and then the closing remarks. Thank you. I've been warned that I mustn't give a keynote address. So my faculty knows that I try very much, sometimes without success. success. Um, Vice Chancellor, uh, Prof. Bongile Mutua, members of council, some of which are, are, are watching uh, this event online, Deputy Vice Chancellors, uh, Professor Kiet, Dr. Mkwebi, uh, Mr. Hashatse, um, the registrar, uh, I believe he's also watching online, Mr. De Kock, the executive deans and deputy deans, um, mostly uh, my deputy dean, uh, Jackie Luck. Um, honorable guest speaker, Mama Dr. Gloria Serobe. Um, Archbishop um, Mahoba, without whom this evening uh, would not have been possible. Um, leaders from different faith groups, um, executive management uh, from our faculty first, and I know that my colleagues from other universities, the deans of humanities faculties. Uh, I note, I saw Professor Masemula from UNISA, so I can recall others who I saw online. Distinguished guests and all our students um, who are watching, um, also who are here and also watching online. Um, good evening. 
I have a few tasks this, week, uh, this evening, and one of them is made because um, the HOD of Public um, Management and Leadership, Dr. Ngamo, fell sick and is not able to present um, the winning student to the Archbishop. So um, I must first announce um, the student with a winning essay on value-based leadership. Before I make that announcement, I would like to invite uh, the bishop, the archbishop, to come forward, please, to present the prize. As you coming, um, archbishop, I just want to just um, read to the audience that the third year class on public management and leadership was required to write an essay on best practices on value-based leadership in the public sector. There is no time to give details here on the process followed um, to select the winning essay, but I wish to announce that Ms. Shubika Zikunda, uh, I hope she is here because we asked that it be good for her. So Ms. Shubika Zikunda wrote the best essay and is recommended as the 2022 winner. Next, um, Professor Keith, I, I am going to make very few reflections on, on, on um, just to reflect on what, on what I've listened um, uh, and really learned um, in this. Um, this is an auspicious occasion for the faculty and, and I think I deserved <laughs> to be given a little bit of time for, for I think for, for five reasons. Um, I've had to note some is, is Umama Udu, Dr. Uh, Serobe was um, uh, giving um, her talk. First, the Nelson Mandela Archbishop, uh, Archbishop Mahoba annual public lecture on value-based leadership has enabled a collaboration that has, that has uh, enabled, as indicated by the um, VC, us to move away from the rhetorical manner in which we engage about critical issues such as leadership as it pertains to organizations such as ours and other public institutions. The five principles um, that um, Umama um, said are the values, um, authenticity, excellence, uh, morals, ethics and governance, uh, spirituality, excellence, they are really important for us um, and we have learned how they've enabled her to drive um, principles um, such as being strongly commercial, making money in the Chicago Stock Exchange, um, but yet very developmental in your approach um, in doing business, um, and, and also in, in leadership uh, practices. And also, um, I'm just looking um, and, and, and learning from your story um, of what it means to be a catalyst for change, how these values ground you to be a catalyst for change. And, and, and also how values learned from the smallest um, uh, social institution, the family, how those, and, and spirituality, which we tend to, to read ourselves off when we get into these spaces, how these mold us um, and become, and help us to become uh, better leaders. What is always important for me, um, and my faculty knows that, is that what do these mean uh, for our teaching processes and practices? Our research um, and in our engagement. As a faculty um, at Nelson Mandela University, as we grapple with Africanization and decolonization of education, how do we engage and learn from these um, such that we influence leadership and management practices in public institutions. In other words, we're not learning for the sake of learning. Um, we're not being educated or we're not educating just for the sake of that. It's how do these influence um, social transformation, 
so that we can fulfill our role as universities to enable um, social transformation and social change. The second point I wanted to make um, is that engaging about value-based um, leadership from Dr. Gloria Serobe's rich um, experience is reminding us as a faculty and perhaps as a university of the need to start revaluing those African intellectuals whose experience are marginalized in these spaces because of social constructs like gender, like identity, like race, political beliefs, clan at times, just to mention a few. The third point I want to make is in relation to Tendani. Um, the issue of the archive, especially about the issue of the archive, memory, and heritage, I did share a little bit about it with the Archbishop. Um, I thought I should, in the presence of, of the, I don't know, the holiness, <laughs> the, <laughs> the Archbishop. I'm Methodist, I'm not Anglican, so I don't know the nomenclature. So I thought I should mention um, also, um, in the presence of um, uh, uh, Dr. Soroba, that as a university, we are conscious that given our history, the transformation of education requires that we look into archive as repositories of memories and possible sources of reliable evidence or almost reliable evidence because we know the history of the archive even is tainted with um, colonialism and so forth. But they are, um, if studied um, diligently, they are reliable evidence um, of examining our past, which we were really grappling with now. The archive, memory, and heritage is one of our research strategic priorities in the faculty and in the university. And amongst other activities, we wish to position the university as a place for identification, documenting, curating, and preserving legacies of African intellectuals, such as this one we've seen here. Um, we played a, a short video clip of um, kind of the story behind Whiphold. And, and I was informed by Umamu Dr. Gloria Serobe that that was, that was a case study that was done by an American university. I think because of the names, I'm gonna forget now the name of the university. It's a Swiss university. And I asked her if there's anything that has been done in South Africa on that story of Whiphold. I may be wrong, but I think your answer, you said no. And, and, and I think I, I'm asking the Center for Gender and Women's Studies, I'm asking the, the chair for um, African Feminist Imagination that this is a project um, from tomorrow uh, onwards. I think, I think it's something that we have to take on. We need to start documenting this because there's lots of African intellectuals who we miss, we've missed opportunities to, to, to look into their work. Some of them are long gone, such as Tio Soga, whose song was sung at the beginning um, here. Rich story, um, I mean, being the first um, veterinarian surgeon, uh, his son being the first veterinarian surgeon, before anyone in the country, um, and, and that story is not well documented, at least not for us in higher education. Uh, People like Jonas Nziko, um, I shared a little bit with the Archbishop as well about the story of someone who was really um, conflicted about what it means to be a Christian if the values that um, um, she can identify with um, require him to let go of his being. So in those writings um, are there, but they are not in the mainstream. We don't get to know about them. Of course, people like Charlotte Makweke, uh, Nunzi Zimkweto, um, and, and those who are really marginalized also because of gender. And I, I, I want to mention Nun Ngause from Tanzania as well, um, is whose story, as complex and baffling as it may be, may add understanding to our past and may, may help us draw lessons from it. Um, we know Nun Ngause as this little girl who was who lied to the Kosa nation, who lied to the Kosa nation, 
and got us to be where we are now. I think there's another story that can be told about a young uh, girl. For our faculty, so the fourth point, our faculty is, a, is passionate about the need to create opportunities of intergenerational dialogue. And this is this example of today is just but one um, such example of how we create spaces for conversations between the older generation and the younger generation. Um, we ask that you patient with them today and in the future because we are building, capacitating uh, those. This is part of capacity enhancement, um, uh, Professor Motwa. So as, as I, um, so I'm gonna come towards the end of this. Um, so these, these young um, people, one of them is an end gap scholar, um, uh, Dr. Sorry, Mr. Uh, Mokele, and the others are just newly appointed last year, um, uh, Ms. Ms. Ramaru, um, and then of course we've got a youngish um, member of staff, <laughs> and they are all in the Department of Public um, Management and Leadership. Um, and I know, um, having engaged with them in the last two days, I know that this, ex this experience will count as one of the most enriching in their experience as members of the faculty. Lastly, I'm not gonna say much about this, I've written a whole lot, but I'm not gonna say. We, we deliberately, when we're given an opportunity, Archbishop, to choose which, which uh, date we will have um, in hosting this. Um, we were given lots of options, and one of them was uh, May month. And we said that um, we choose the May month um, because it's African month. And I think I leave it to your imagination to, to think of the reasons uh, behind that. Um, let me now, I, I'm also almost coming to an end. Let, let me now uh, do the thanks. Um, I really want to thank um, you, Mama, for, for, for enlivening, um, reinvigorating our thinking about leadership. Um, your, 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 your input, um, is critical as we, again, I want to repeat, reinvigorate engagement around public management, governance, and leadership with a focus on ethical and value-based leadership as embodied in the leadership qualities of public intellectuals such as you, um, Dr. Sarebo. To the Archbishop um, uh, and the Archbishop Mahoba Development trust, we are absolutely grateful for today and for the fact that the, the collaboration may birth other possibilities. We thank you for reminding us to showcase our students through the, endow the endowment made by the trust to the university. Thank you, you, thank you VC and the rest of the uh, senior management of the university for the support of the project of the revitalization of the humanities. We thank the program director, our moderator, and the outstanding panelists, so obviously. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Dr. Laura Best um, and Dr. Denver Webb for supporting us from the start when we received the invitation from the Archbishop and for this collaboration and backing us um, when we're preparing for today. Deputy Dean, the rest of the um, executive management from the faculty, I, I take note um, of them. They were told that they must attend today, yesterday at the FMC. So that's why they are here <laughs> in Gosigaku. Of course, they, 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 uh, my, my office staff, um, I'm causing them headaches. Well, they, Ms. Dem, Ms. Um, Tise, Ms. Sam Tise and uh, Mr. Nkulegom Kosana. I, I promised that myself that I'll have to mention them today. Now many of us, many of them who are in the background who have been instrumental in ensuring the success um, of today. And of course we thank the audience, uh, those present in the venue and those who are watching online. Um, so thank you very much. Now I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Fana uh, to come forward um, and present our guests with gifts. Um, I wish to also, perhaps it's important to know that um, 
these presents are a true reflection, um, Dr. Mkwebi, of the academic activities from students and our staff. The, the ceramics, um, as you see here, the ceramics have been made from our ceramic studios in the School of Visual and Performing Arts, led by uh, Professor Peter Binsbergen at the back. And the Dukes, um, you, you get the Duke Archbishop as well, but it's for, it's for, it's for uh, Umama. The, the Dukes are inspired by our research outputs from our doctoral students uh, in the Department of Physicosa in the School of Language, Media and Communication, led by Professor Marius Kraus. Lastly, the books um, are authored by or feature works of our scholars from the departments of sociology and history in the School of Governmental and Social Sciences. So all our schools are represented in what we're offering as gifts to our guests. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, uh, my responsibility is just a little just need to pass on the gifts to the Archbishop and also to Dr. Uh, Serot. Uh, uh, before I do so, uh, uh, I would like to take this opportunity also to actually say thank you to Archbishop and also to you, Dr. Serot, and uh, the Trust for choosing to actually partner with us as the Nelson Mandela University. Uh, we feel honored uh, and we are very excited about the path that you are actually taking. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To you, Doc, we say thank you for the, the, the lecture that you gave us, it's had the inspiring. Uh, we, uh, one thing that I take note of from the conversation that was had here, you can actually say, you are saying we must go back to the big six, go back to our roots uh, and remember where we're coming from so that we are in a better position to actually know where we are going. So thank you very much. We hope that you will enjoy your, okay. your, your, your presence. Thank you. Thank you. got to apologize for the here. We've got gifts that we received from the Archbishop and and they, they are between I think they are in, we left them in the office and okay, we will we will convey we'll give them to the VC at the appropriate time. Um, thank you very much uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, we say in Afri in Yuma, in our faculty we say Nisenze Abantu, meaning you have reinvigorated um, humanity in us. We also express gratitude with a wish for sustained relationships. We say Makwande, uh, rather we say Nangamso, and for growth and expansion, we say Makwande. Isiabulele. I, pardon me, let me take this uh, chance with you being here, Bishop, and ask you, Archbishop, and ask um, whether you might offer a spiritual reflection to send us off. Thank you very much. I won't be uh, long. Today we've listened to many voices and we've brought our stories also into this uh, auditorium. We thank God for Dr. Sorobe and for this uh, university that has created a space for us to reflect 
to bring our own journeys into the conversation and into the input. We've heard that as a country in 1994, we inherited a junk status. Today, the invitation is let us never allow for a moral junk status in this our country. For a moral junk status may lead us into naming the other as a cockroach. And if we do that, like we know in Rwanda, we may not put doom on a cockroach, we may yank it. So thank you for appealing to those uh, ideals and higher values. And the invitation is we can do it as individuals, we can do it as a collective. Let us remember our vocation to do the heavy lifting for the good of this country, for the good of the world. Let us give peace a chance, particularly in a world where the ammunition industry is spending more and more dollars. So our voice of peace should not be drowned. And so that is my reflection for today as I urge you to be people of values, to be people that live with the morals that Dr. Sorovia spoke about. I thank you. To those that joined electronically, it's been great to have you. Thank you to all of you as well who came. We are, it's, it's done. Thank you. Don't want to talk after my boss has already closed the meeting.